It appears as an owl or a fox, screeching and barking an omen of evil things on the prowl. If another owl or fox doesn't respond, you'll know it's Shilamobish. According to the Choctaw folklore, every man is followed by this outside shadow, as well as by the Shilap, which is the inside shadow or ghost. After every man dies, the inside shadow heads into the land of the ghosts, while the outside shadow remains on earth, wandering around, moaning, these shadow-like beings frightening all who are still living. Welcome to a very special edition of Native Choctaw Halloween, where we'll talk Choctaw legends and mythology, as well as learn from an expert about the creatures that some say is folktale, while others believe in the existence of the shy beast known as Bigfoot. Warning, this may not be for children and is not for the faint of spirit, so if you're not into stories of creatures who roam at night trying to steal your soul, you may want to turn this podcast off right now, or perhaps hide under the covers while you're listening. But before you crawl under the blankets, don't forget to check under your bed. In 1958, Loggers in California wrote a letter to the Humboldt Times stating that they had stumbled upon some extremely large and mysterious footprints. Andrew Gonzoli, a journalist for the paper, published the letter thinking it would, quote, make a good Sunday morning story. Little did he know this was the start of the cult following of a so-called beast that ever elusively roamed the woods rarely to be spotted. The beast's name? Bigfoot, named by the loggers themselves who first reported the tracks. To most, Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch in North American folklore, is an enormous hairy creature that has been rarely cited, thus causing all of us to wonder if it's a hoax or just an introverted creature who doesn't like to be photographed. Every year is Honobia's Bigfoot Festival and Conference, usually in October. You guys should check it out. Bring the family. Come on out, y'all. It's a lot of fun. It's about three and a half hours southeast of Oklahoma City, which is fairly close to the Arkansas border. And by the way, it's an incredibly beautiful area made up of forests and mountains. It looks like so much fun. There's a Bigfoot 5K run. There's camping. There's even a scholarship fund. So feel free to check out the website at H-O-N-O-B-I-A Bigfoot.com. Now, Bigfoot is popular all over the country, but in Oklahoma, it's a big deal, no pun intended. In fact, I kid you not, our own state representative posed a bill that, to his surprise, initiated excitement like he never would have imagined. Next Star Media Wire, Mystery Wire, published an article on May 10th, 2021, titled, Oklahoma Bigfoot Bounty Passes $2 Million If Captured Unharmed. I'll read a couple of excerpts from that article. For many, the idea of capturing a mythical creature is unthinkable, let alone believable. But for some, the idea is not only alive and well, there's now more than $2 million on the line. At the end of January, Oklahoma State Representative Justin Humphrey, Republican, filed legislation to establish what he hoped would be a boom for local tourism, a Bigfoot hunting season. Over the next few weeks, the bill died in committee, but that hasn't stopped some from continuing the effort to encourage someone to capture Bigfoot. State Representative Humphrey has since told the Enid News and Ingle newspaper that he's okay with this bill not making it out of committee. Humphrey said the exposure his bill received did exactly what he wanted it to do, to promote interest and tourism in southeast Oklahoma. Humphrey and others have claimed this area of Oklahoma has the ninth most sightings in the world of Bigfoot. Humphrey is now working with state officials to set up rules for a Sasquatch quest. He's quick to point out the idea is to not kill anything, but to capture Bigfoot unharmed and without breaking any Oklahoma laws. According to the Enid News and Eagle, Humphrey's original plan suggested lawmakers set aside a $25,000 bounty for Bigfoot's capture. But he said an upcoming Hollywood Bigfoot movie pledged around $2 million, while another private business promised an additional $100,000. That eliminated any need for state funding. He says the state should also include a proper map showing people recommended areas to spot Bigfoot. The profits from the Bigfoot tourism campaign would be used for lake, park, and road improvements. 
We're having fun with it, he said. It's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. But at the same time, I know a lot of people thought I was crazy. But I think if people chill out, they could see that this could be a serious deal, bringing in a lot of money, a lot of tourism. Humphrey said his ultimate goal is to draw in tourists by providing safe, affordable fun. I hope people get here and ride four-wheelers and do fishing and go to the restaurants and sleep in motels, he said. Come to Oklahoma, have an adventure, enjoy yourself, tell your friends, and come back. You go, Oklahoma. In a previous recording with one of our Choctaw friends, Solomon Tonica, he and his wife told us of some Bigfoot sightings on their property in Wright City, Oklahoma. Check it out. And as far as talking about Bigfoot or Hatahulba, Hatahulba, we pronounce it in Choctaw, is um, human-like or man-like. But my granny said they used to sit on the porch at nighttime, and even my dad talking about it. They'd hear Tinta Saha, they holler at each other. And another one would holler, Ma, Hatahulba, Tinta Saha, Tinta Saha. They lost one another, and they hollering for each other, and they eventually meet up. Wow. And I don't know if it was a mating call or one of them got right. lost or what, but that's what they used to say. And the older ones talk about things like that. Mm-hmm. And I never seen that, and I just wondered, what's that the whole about? You yeah. know, they would tell you, you know, it's, it's a human life, it's a creature, it's so tall, you know. And when I met my wife, we moved to Idabel, mm-hmm. and my dad lived here. And he had no car. And right out here, about where my grandson's got that basketball goal, was a, a bad spot. And all his whole water was a ditch, uh-huh. you know, just a puddle. And it dried up, and all it had was mud. And my dad used to like to go here to the pine tree, and he'd take the little metal chair like this and sit under the pine tree, or he'd lay there on the ground, you know, under the shade, mm-hmm. in the shade. Well, he started going over there one day, one morning, and and there was a footprint. He said it had to be over uh, uh, over 20 inches. He said it was a big footprint, the toes and everything. Ooh. And he always <laughs> he always talked about Hatakulba or Bigfoot. And even when we lived in that three-room shotgun house, that, me as a kid, we went to church. we come in, and it had been raining and raining for a number of days. So everything was muddy. And this was in early 70s. Well, my mom got a new Maytag washer, the one that had the ring grip. We had it on the back porch. Yeah. We come in from church, and we didn't have no running water, so there was always a bucket of water on the back porch and a dipper hanging up. And you'd dip it and drink your water. Well, yeah. my dad, he liked fresh water, so he would always walk over here and draw water at night and bring it back. Well, he went out, and he said, Hey, how can I draw a washing machine? Don't go by the guy. And mom said, what? Somebody stole my washing machine, you know. Oh, no. And so she comes out, and he goes in and gets his flashlight and shines it, you know, this telephone pole right here or this electric pole. Right. Right there. Just right before you get to it, there was that washing machine. No way. But something had threw the washing machine, and it had embedded in that wet, soft <laughs> ground. And it was full of dirt, but it was just like, no. it was just like if it was clay, you just mashed it in. Oh my gosh. But somebody <laughs> threw that heavy washer, and my dad said, Hatakulbat <laughs> had came by and did that. I remember that. So Big it was heavy, and we had to, had to take it out, clean it all up, and we finally put it back on the porch. And so when he sees this Bigfoot print, he ain't got no. You know, that's days didn't even have a camera. My dad didn't have no camera. No. And he came, he just walked this little ways. Then he had to sit in. So he'd take his middle chair. And it's early in the morning, you know. So he's walking to the neighbor. My neighbor at the steel is over here. Yeah. And he said, I know he got camera. He'd take pictures. He got all the old there. And he said, it took him a couple hours to get to because he'd walk a wall, sit a wall, walk a wall, sit a wall. Mm-hmm. And then Edgar told him, said, awesome. I'm not going to come over there and take a picture of that. And he said, people think you crazy. If me and you say something like that, they think we're crazy. They won't put us in crazy home. No, I'm not going to come take a picture <laughs> of it. He said, somebody just printed it there and make you think that. So he turned around and come back. He said, walk a while, sit a while, walk a while. He got <laughs> almost to this barn 
in this red barn. He's on the other side. Here come a car. There's oh somebody's coming. So he gets his chair and they, they come up here and they uh honk and horn, honk and horn. And then directly they start back out and he said he hollered and waved his hand because he's still on the other side of the barn in the woods. He'll holler, ah, and that's car leaves. He said, Oh no, surely not. He said he got finally made it up here. The car had went right through there and run over there. So he said, I had no proof. No proof. But these things that we talk about, we experience or we see or we hear things. My wife saw a couple just down down the road here. If you, when you leave here and get to the county road, there's a big barn, and then there's a dip like this in the road. Mm -hmm. And just the other side, used to be a patch of trees right there. It was kind of mm -hmm. thick before they cleaned it out. And she she was all excited and, and, and uh, uh, called me and said that one of them, the little one, she said the little one got hung up in the fence. Mm. And she said it had to be the mama was getting in the way. Tell, tell that where you seen she was climbing over the fence, and her hair got caught. Oh. And the bower, and her hair got caught. But she got loose. Well, she raised up that bower fence for her little one. Oh. And the little one crawled under. And I was in my car, and I, you know, when people say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Yeah. No, you're just frozen. And I said, if I lose, if I blink, or if I turn my head, or they'd be gone. So I just watched it. And I just stopped. I literally yeah. stopped. And I watched her walk across. And then that little one pointed at me. And the mama, you know, <gasps> grabbed oh the arm. And they both went down. You know, he just went, like he got in trouble. Put his head down. And then it looked like they were saying something. And he, she walked on. And then they walked into, you know, in the deep woods. It's already dark. Yeah. They went in that dark. And they were gone. Whoa. Yeah, they were gone. I and bet I, you wish you had a video camera or something on you at that time or something. Yeah. But, you know, I just got it in my head. No, it, it's it just. And you may have missed the moment if you're trying to grab your phone or something. You were right. Yeah. Right. And I was like, wow. And I, and I would watch TV, you know, and they say, I want to do this. I'm going to kill him. I want to do this. Yeah. No, you won't. It <laughs> just it's freeze. Just like, it's just like they hypnotize you and you're just there and you just watch them. You can't do nothing. And then I was like, really? Did that happen? So I'll call them. So I told him, and yeah. then he, I said, he said, okay, I'm going to check on it. He got on a four-wheeler, Yeah. him and his friend, and they seen that hair. Whoa. They seen on that the hair fence. On the fence. And oh, it's my gosh. It's coursey. It's, on, it's like more coursier than a horse tail. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I want to yeah. see the little one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that little one, they're not as ugly as they portray them to be. Yeah. I mean, she was tall. I mean, mm -hmm. she was pretty tall. And he was came up almost to her shoulder. Oh, okay. But he was little. I yeah. mean, I you could know. tell he was a baby. Yeah, yeah, he was oh young. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So. And that's that's what you get more out here when there is more of a rural area, probably because there's more trees. There's a whole lot less people out here. It's beautiful out here. I wish our listeners could see it. There's it's just forest everywhere, and not again, not many homes, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I seen two. Like a male, and I don't know if the one he was walking with is a female. Yeah, I don't know. He just bulky. Yeah. Like a male, and then the other one was a little bit smaller and a little shorter. So I was assuming it might have been a female or a young one. Mm -hmm. And but I was, you know, I drove truck for Tyson for twenty five years, hauling live chickens, and we mm -hmm. was going to Smithville, and just the other side of Mount Herman, there's a road that goes downhill like this. And that was before they clear-cutted it, and all the pine trees were still there. And I just so happened to look, and three or four of us was running together. They just went by, and I I see them walking. They're walking down the hill on this road. All I can see is they're, they're, they're about, their, about their waist up. And it's just a kind of a reddish, brownish hair. But you couldn't tell there was a neck. It was just, just the shape. Yeah. And just... As I look, as I start to go by, the big one, he turns like this. Oh. And his, the, the face part of him is a darker. Mm -hmm. But you could tell the outline of a face, but it was darker. Mm -hmm. But it was hairy. The other one didn't turn, but he just started to turn. 
And you talking about freaking out. I was out hollering on the radio. You know, did you see that? You said, and and, you know, and did my, anybody else see it? My CB handle was Geronimo, and I was the last truck. Uh-huh. So they said, that's all they talk about. Oh, Geronimo's drunk. He didn't have too much fire water. And so I said, that was, that was when I'm like, Mr. Steele, you don't tell people, but they think you're crazy. Right. Or it makes you look crazy. Exactly. So things like that, we keep to ourselves. Now, listeners, for those of you who are a little squeamish, you know who you are. We've had some fun with this G-rated Bigfoot discussion so far, but now we're headed into the S rated section s for scary so if there's ever time to call it a night this would be the time to go and for you scary story pros like my sister skylar and my aunt annette it's time to turn off the lights light a candle and sit back for a story or two we're going to talk now about the lafleur county bigfoot war the year is 1855 in lafleur county which is in eastern Oklahoma, which was called Indian Territory at the time. A strange occurrence was taking place across the land, even on into Arkansas. One day, a Choctaw man went outside and noticed some of his livestock were missing. Then he was talking to another Choctaw man who said his wife was complaining that her vegetables were gone, just plum gone. So the Choctaw community gathered some volunteers to watch throughout the night. One man stated that he would hear voices and noises to the east and to the west, but never truly saw the bandits, so they decided perhaps the sneaky thieves were extra stealthy. Some farmers in Arkansas even set traps around their property, but still no bites. Oh well, thought the Choctaws and their Arkansas neighbors. The thought of their goods being stolen was annoying, but no one was being harmed, so they decided to just go about their day. That is, until it happened. A Choctaw man kissed his wife and kids goodbye as he set out one morning to tend to his cattle, as he normally did every single day. But upon his arrival home at sunset, the door to the house was open and a jar of milk was broken. The milk spilled onto the stairway and flies were partaking in the sweet substance. The man immediately began to worry. It wasn't like his wife to leave such a scenario strewn about. His heart began to pound as he stepped into the home. No candles were lit, and the sun was quickly sinking over the hill to light the other side of the world. His mind began to consider the worst. Would he find his wife lying sick on her bed, unable to continue her daily routine, and he would have to take loving care of her to nurse her back to health? And what of their children, who normally ran to greet their father upon his return from the pasture? His eyes blinked, trying to adjust to the lack of light in the cabin. It felt as if there was no energy in the room, no sense of life. So his heart began to pound even harder as he felt his way around, searching for a candle and means to light the room. His fingers rippled over the kitchen table, hoping he wouldn't cut his finger on the bread knife that was normally present. He did feel something. Hair. Oh no. Was it his wife slumped over the table? But this hair was bristly, not soft as he knew the love of his life's hair to be. Then he felt it, a fingernail, but approximately four inches thick and sharp from needing to be shaped. He cut his finger on the ragged edge of it, and just as he felt the hair finger and the broken fingernail, he felt it pull away. His heart that was once beating hard now felt as though it stopped. His ears began to ring as he felt his head start to spin and his eyes rolling back in his head. Soon, he was passed out on the floor, unable to achieve his goal of lighting the room with a candle. It was morning. The sound of waking animals ready for the day awoke the Choctaw man, who was laying on his back on the dirt floor, his head pounding from what he discovered resulted in his head hitting on the side of the table on his way down to the floor. At least that's what he assumed. After five minutes of pulling himself together and remembering the events of the previous evening, he quickly sprung into action. His wife, his kids, where were they? He scrambled through the two-room dirt floor cabin, pulling back the blankets, fully well knowing the bed was too flat for a human to be underneath. 
But there was that little hope that maybe he would find his little two-year-old Nashoba, his little boy whom they affectionately called Wolf. Or perhaps he would find his little girl hiding under the table, as she often did in a joyous game of hide and find me. He then once again saw the broken glass and milk now mostly dried onto the cross-tie step that led into the house. Where was his beautiful wife? The girl he grew up with in their little community, the girl he pledged his love to at age 15, and they knew they'd enjoy their life together forever. They were gone. The Choctaw man soon found that although he was first to find his precious family had disappeared one by one, Lafleur County was diminished in population with the constant loss of women and children. Children were forced to stay by their parents' side then, all through the day and the night. Women worked in the fields with their husbands in order to remain safe. Yet even within seconds of the turn of a husband's head while tending to the horses, he'd then look up to find his wife and children gone. No scream, no sound, no tracks, just gone. Forever. Something had to be done. All were called to the church one Sunday evening to form a plan. Ultimately, 30 brave volunteer Choctaw cavalrymen set out for justice, with Joshua LaFleur, a Choctaw and French man, being designated as the leader of the group. Mr. LaFleur was well respected by his Choctaw community, so there was a unanimous vote for his position. In addition, Hamas Tabi, highly regarded Choctaw warrior and horseman, and his six sons were also sent to hunt down the bandits. It is said these men were seven feet tall, weighing over 300 pounds, very unusual compared to the typical Choctaw, who were usually small in stature. These warriors were eventually known as the Light Horsemen. The community lined both sides of the road with their torches set on fire to symbolize their support as these men set out to defend their families and land. Off they went on their Choctaw horses into the night to face the wilderness area of McCurtain County. Mr. LaFleur ordered his team to charge into the pine trees where he thought the kidnappers would be hiding. Each man faced the fear of the unknown. After all, these enemies were stealthy and had yet to even be seen. But they knew in their spirits that their community needed them, that their bravery was needed now more than ever. As the men rode into the pine trees, keeping an eye out for anything that looked like their evil offenders, their brave fierceness was soon overcome by a stench so volatile they were overcome and began to gag and cough. It was a smell all too familiar. They had experienced this same smell from an occasional decaying livestock when a black bear had made a midnight attack. Were there dead livestock nearby? Soon the coughing was interrupted by a reaction to their horses, rearing up, throwing off their riders. Each man, the most excellent horseman of their Choctaw tribe, attempted to gain control of the frightened beasts who were bucking and kicking their feet into the air. One man looked into his normally calm horse's face and saw a fear radiating through the horse's eyes like he had never seen before. Once he saw that look of terror, he released his horse's reins and set him free. Whatever his partner horse was feeling... It was time to set him into the wilderness to escape whatever horror was foreseen in those eyes. All but eight men followed the same procedure, releasing their horses with the thought that they may never see them again. The eight men, still riding, took off at full speed toward a danger they could sense ahead. The closer they rode, they could make out the shape of three non-human creatures. And these beasts were not intimidated by these 300-pound Choctaw warriors storming towards them. Instead, they stood their ground, beating at their breasts, screaming loudly enough to burst one's eardrums. Snarls and a mucus-like spit drained out of their mouths, dripping onto their hairy bodies. The brave men still forged forward, although their warrior spirits turned to shock and a sense of bewilderment as they observed their enemy. Lafleur drew his saber and his pistol, charging toward one of the beasts with one single stroke to the horse's head, knocked it to the ground, dead upon impact. Lafleur acted quickly, firing shots into the beast's chest. When the bullets did very little harm, Lafleur slashed the beast with his saber, angering him as his wounds gaped open, blood pouring to the earth. However, Lafleur focused on the animal in front of him. To his demise, he neglected to keep an eye on what may be coming up behind him. 
two hands attached to large, hairy, spindly fingers creeped out of the darkness, grasping the back of LaFleur's head. For a short moment, LaFleur suddenly felt both the pressure from the clenching fists and the agony from the nails which inevitably were tearing into the skin of his face. But as quickly as his head was grasped in those monstrous hands, he felt his life leaving his body as he heard a popping sound. It was his spine. The creature had twisted his head and ripped it off his shoulders. Angered by observing their fearless leader losing his life, the tubbies fired upon the beasts with their fifty caliber buffalo rifles. The attack was a success as two beasts were killed, while the third fled into the forest, wounded by the shots. The ever-so-brave 18-year-old, 6-foot-11-inch Robert Tubby kicked his horse, prompting him to take him to the creature as fast as his warrior horse legs would take him. Robert sprung off of his horse onto the beast and single-handedly took him down with his knife, the animal roaring and wailing, mucus draining from his nose and mouth as he surrendered to his assailant. Each warrior took a moment to gather his breath and assess their defeated prey. But soon they all had to acknowledge the stench that permeated around them. There at their feet were the lifeless bodies of their women and children, partially eaten by their kidnappers. There was little Neshoba still clutching his blanket that he had pulled along with him as the beast pulled him from the cabin, and beside him his mother and sister who had attempted to pull him from the beast's grasp that October evening while Dad was gone and they were bringing milk into the house from the cowshed. Luckily the beast lulled them to sleep on their journey to the nesting ground, so no pain was experienced, but nevertheless the warriors took time to mourn and weep aloud for the tribe's tremendous loss. Each and every woman and child, as well as Joshua LaFleur, was buried there, while the beasts were simultaneously burned. To this day, the area in LaFleur County is not spoken of, nor do any Choctaws walk near the location. The weary Choctaw warriors came home to Tushkahoma, which fittingly means Red Warrior, but their fight wasn't over. Every night, the tubby men still fought the beasts in their dreams, the nightmares always terrorizing their sleep. In all transparency, this Choctaw folklore is actually just about some hairy beasts who were kidnapping women and children in LaFleur County in Arkansas. So I expanded it into a story so you could get a more detailed picture of what may have happened. I hope you liked it. I wrote it myself. Do you think the basis of the story was true? There actually did live a man named Joshua LaFleur, and the tubby men also existed. However, it has also been said by some, such as Jim King, a researcher, that a similar event did happen, but in Kiowa territory, which is further west. Are there any Kiowa out there that can share a similar story that you may know of? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story of the LaFleur County Bigfoot War. So I have two sisters and we have a daily group text going and sometimes with our mom as well. And we're always sharing about suspenseful movies to watch or funny memes. And the other day, my sister sent me the following eerie Choctaw story. I'll read this to you. It was on uh, Tumblr. Nalosafalaya. A monster from the Choctaw tribe in North America, the Nalosafalaya is a fearsome being that terrified native hunters. It looks like a tall, shriveled human with a snout-like nose, black skin, and pointed ears. It is also said that it has the ability to melt into a shadow and transform into a snake-like creature. It also likes to hide in shadows around dusk in order to frighten children. The Nalesa Falaya attacks hunters at twilight. It first attracts a hunter's attention by calling out their name. When the hunter turns around, they are so affected by the Nalesa Falaya's power that they fall helpless to the ground. While its victim is unable to fight them, the Nalesa Falaya will insert a thorn into their body. This thorn will drive the hunter to unwillingly carry out evil acts against other people. According to the legend, the hunter will not remember being attacked by the Nalesa Falaya until after they have started performing evil deeds. The Nalesa Falaya can also breed. Its children remove their organs at night and walk around the forests where they live, carrying their entrails in their hands. These children are luminous in appearance, which makes them appear similar to will-o'-wisps. Now, I have to admit, although I don't like to hear of anyone being hurt or tormented, when they mess with the kids, it really hurts my gut. Don't mess with a kid's man. Anyway, 
Anyway, can you handle more of these stories? If you're still with me, you Halloween creepiness seekers, I've got three more for you. These are short ones, though. Shadow beings are big in Choctaw folklore. There once was a black being, a soul eater that the old timers called Nalesa Chito. The elders would tell the youngsters, don't think bad thoughts because Nalesa Chito would crawl inside of them and eat their souls out. Now, many Choctaws won't say that name because it will summon the spirit. And here I am saying the name. Hopefully no spirits will get me. Does it count if I'm mixed blood? Hopefully I get a pass. I don't know. Okay, next story. There is a beast that is not a creature, yet not a man that lives in the swamps. His name is Kashe Hotapolo, and he has a body of a man, yet like a deer. It has legs and hooves. He has a creepy, small, shriveled face and head, and he sneaks up behind the hunters in the swamps, and then he screams loudly. People say he screams a high shrill that sounds just like a woman. The good news is he doesn't hurt anyone, but he loves to frighten the hunters. And finally, we have the stories of the owls. The horned owl, known as Ishkitini, hunts at night for men and animals who dare to be out past dark. If he came up on these men and animals, he would screech, suddenly killing them. Opa is a common owl, and he calls atop barns or trees, warning that there will be an upcoming death. So fear the horned and Opa owls, y'all. I'm not even kidding. For those of you who have made it this far and aren't hiding under your covers, you have now reached pro level in native Choctaw Halloween stories. Happy Halloween, y'all, and yako ki. Potential is everywhere in the Choctaw people. It's in our schools and students. It's in our small businesses and entrepreneurs. Potential is in our lifestyle and health. It's in our culture and heritage. Passion and commitment is in our blood. Ingenuity and economy are a tradition. And the Chutha Foundation was founded for this potential. To cultivate minds and hearts, to stimulate ideas and passions, to extend lives and improve health, through education and to preserve and promote the power of our past. The Chata Foundation, meeting the potential of the Choctaw people. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native C H O C T A L K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>